Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's global event. I am James Cherkasky, Executive Director of the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research, a 501c3 educational foundation serving as the privately funded Friends of NEI. AVER's been pleased to partner the past five years with the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society to provide an annual Dry Eye Awareness Month congressional briefing. This year, we are live streaming. Due to some technical difficulties, you will be seeing the slides, you will hear our voices, but you will not see us speaking at the podium. So again, you can focus your attention on the slides. I'd like to thank ARVO, the, the Association for Research and Vision Ophthalmology, for its assistance in the, providing the YouTube video and also Novartis for administrative support. Since the Dry Eye Workshop 2 report was issued by TIFOS in year 2017, these educational sessions have been focusing on different aspects of dry eye, its causes and treatments. And of course, as you can see this year, we're focusing on the impact of lifestyle changes during the COVID-19 pandemic on vision. Speaking of vision research, I want to acknowledge that the National Institutes of Health, primarily its National Eye Institute, does sponsor federally funded research into dry eye, as well as private industry. The NEI has recently formed a, an anterior segment initiative, which will be focusing on issues such as inflammation and dry eye. I now like to turn the podium over to our moderator, Dr. Bridget Shen Li. She is the co-founder of Vision Optique, a private optometric practice founded in 1999 and is located in Houston. She serves as an advisor and speaker on the topics of ocular health, contact lens, social media, the aging eye, and eye beauty and product, product, products. Bridget. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining us, both here in person and virtually from all around the world. My name is Dr. Brigitte Shen Li. I'm a private practice co-owner in Houston. I serve as a global ambassador for the Tear Film and the Ocular Surface Society, and as a medical advisor and a spokesperson for the Vision Council. Today, my colleagues and I will share the impact of the COVID-19 digital lifestyle on our eyes. I will start by discussing digital eye strain symptoms, including dry eyes. I will bring special attention to the increasing incidences of dry eyes in children. Dr. Scott Schechter will discuss the impact from cosmetics and a contact lens use. Dr. Essen Akpek will discuss the impact of malnutrition and growing depression. Jim will conclude with a summary of what we need for the 2021 budget increase request. At the current time, people who are diagnosed with a COVID-19 disease are over 11 millions in the world and almost 3 millions in the US. In the last five months, a third of the American adults have worked from home. Almost 50 millions of American kids are doing schoolwork, attending camps, and enjoying entertainment on their devices. So how much time do Americans spend on their digital devices? Let's take a look at the data. The Vision Council is the leading advocacy and a consumer outreach organization for the optical industry. The Vision Watch survey is the only large scale continuous consumer survey designed specifically for the optical industry and it was formed in 2005. Thank you Vision Council for compiling three years of data into these three slides. This table summarizes some of the results from the 2016, 2018, and 2019 surveys. 
Each survey had over 10,000 US adult residents. Over 30% of them have children under age 18 living at home. More than 50% of the adults spend at least more than six hours each day on various devices. Almost 50% of the kids spend up to four hours a day on devices. And when you look at the last column, it shows that more than 30% of the kids spend more than four hours a day on the devices. Do you think the stats are much higher during the COVID-19 pandemic? Absolutely, yes. Now let's review the top symptoms in detail. On this slide, the top five reported symptoms in adults are eye strain, neck and shoulder pain, blurred vision, headache, and dry eyes. So when you look at this graph, the gray that you see represent 2016, blue is 2018, and the orange are data from 2019. So look at four years ago in 2016, only one in five reported blurred vision, headache, and dry eyes, the gray bars that you see on the screen. Four years later in 2019, almost one in three reported same symptoms. Look at the orange bars. I don't think anyone is surprised to see that all the symptoms are much higher in 2019 than 2016. Now let's look at the digital eye strain symptoms in children. So on this slide, the top six reported symptoms in children are poor behavior, irritability, reduced attention span, eye strain, dry and irritated eyes, headache, and neck and shoulder pain. In 2019, surveyed parents reported almost two out of every 10 children had behavior issues. One out of every 10 children experienced headache, eye strain, dry and irritated eyes. One out of every 20 children experienced neck and a shoulder pain. Digital eye strain is the new term that describes a group of symptoms related to using digital devices. It encompasses muscular skeletal, visual, and eye strain symptoms. Muscular skeletal symptoms include neck and shoulder pain, back pain, and the hand wrist pain. They result mostly from our postures, devices used, and poor computer station ergonomics. All of us in the room and those who are watching virtually are doing this on a daily basis. Have you heard of the term text neck? Did you know that this head lowering posture can add up to 60 pounds of weight on our shoulders? Now, are you surprised that that is a number one complaint? Neck and shoulder pain can be prevented by reducing the amount of time that we spend on handheld devices, watching our postures, taking stretch breaks, and arranging good computer workstation ergonomics. The second group of digital eye strain symptoms are those that affect our vision. The four visual symptoms are blurred vision, fluctuating vision, double vision, and a trouble with focusing. Column on the right lists top contributing factors. Dry eyes or unstable tear film contribute to three of the four visual symptoms and they are highlighted in yellow. In the background is a photo of a very dry cornea surface. Cornea is the clear dome-shaped membrane in front of our iris. It needs to be clear and healthy in order for us to have clear vision. The bright yellow spots that you see on the screen are superficial punctate keratitis, or SPK, and they represent devitalized or dead epithelial cells, and this is what a broken or unstable tear film looks like. And this is what the eyeball with a dry disease looks like. Thank you, Dr. John Gellis, for this photo. 
the third group of digital eye strain symptoms is referred to as asthenopia, which in Greek means weak eye conditions. It includes all the symptoms on the left side of the table. The external symptoms are dry eyes, burning sensation, visual discomfort, and irritated eyes. The internal symptoms are eye strain, eye pain, a headache, and a fatigue. Column on the right lists top contributing factors. Everything highlighted in yellow are related to dry eyes. Dr. Schechter will cover the impact of contact lens and cosmetics use. Dr. Akpek will cover the impact of poor nutrition and mental health. Meibomian gland dysfunction, or MGD, is the leading cause of dry eye disease. And this claim is supported by almost two decades of published research. It contributes to 86% of diagnosed dry eye patients, 63% of patients receiving cataract surgeries, and 60% of contact lens wearers who report dry eye symptoms. The photo is a meibomian gland image of a 76 years old patient prior to his cataract surgery. The white tube-like structures are the actual meibomian glands. The gray empty area that you see indicate complete gland loss. The darker black or gray areas in the middle of the glands indicate atrophying or dying glands. In 2019, I was invited here to present on public health challenge, dry eye in children. In the next series of slides, you will see both review and update from last year's presentation. We have been taking meibomian gland images on patients since 2016. We are seeing higher instances of kids reporting dry eye symptoms and presenting with clinical signs. This slide shows the gland images of a 11-year-old girl in 2016, then again in 2019 at age 14. Look at the right eye in the nasal area. You can see the actual glands there in 2016. Four years later, those glands are atrophying or disappearing. You can see similar findings on the left side. Some of the top risk factors are similar to what we see in adults. A leading factor is our addiction to our devices. When we are focused on our phones for a long time, we are blinking about twice a minute instead of the normal 15 times per minute. The reduced blink rate can lead to reduced tear film quantity, less of the tear spreading across the eyeball surface and tear quantity and that can in turn lead to dry symptoms and dry eye disease. Another top factor is lack of daily lids lashes hygiene habits. What percentage of our young and teenage boys are washing their face and lids and lashes every day? Not many. What percentage of our twin and the teen girls are wearing makeup on a regular basis, way too many. And properly removing those makeup at the end of the day, every day, definitely not all of them. This beautiful young woman that you see on the screen is the most followed teen beauty blogger in the world with 40 million followers on Instagram and YouTube. Dr. Schechter will discuss in details how much more education and research are needed regarding safe cosmetics use. The background meibomian gland image is a nine-year-old boy's right eye. Significant gland loss has already occurred. Dr. Ekpek will discuss the effect of a typical American diet on our bodies and our eyes. In addition, she will discuss the increased incidences of depression and mental health issues. 
close to 50% of American kids younger than age 11 and 84% of teens have their own smartphones as of late 2019. They are spending more time on them every year. The background my bombing gland image is the same nine-year-old boy's left eye. He is one of the youngest dry patients that I am treating and following. Think Blink is a public awareness campaign from TFOS. It teaches healthy digital habits and remember to blink. 2020 is a public education campaign from the American Optometric Association. For every 20 minutes of looking at devices, look up and out to 20 feet away and rest your eyes for 20 seconds. We teach our patients 2020, 20, blink and stretch. The top study by Dr. Gupta and her group was published in 2018. It is still the only published study based on 99 kids from the US. The bottom study by Dr. Moon and the group was published in 2016. It is based on almost 1,000 elementary school kids in South, in South Korea and it is the most referenced pediatric dry eye disease study. Dry eye disease affects vision, quality of life, school learning, and the work productivity. Severe dry eye disease can, can lead to depression and even suicide. Dr. Ekpek will discuss more. The background meibomian gland images are from a 16-year-old teenage boy. More than 70% of the glands are already gone. We need more research funding to study the long-term effect of digital lifestyle on both external ocular surface and tear film and internal ocular health. The background images are from a 17-year-old teenage girl. You can see the significant glance loss. She is on her phone a lot, wears contact lens, and uses cosmetics. Ladies and gentlemen, now Dr. Scott Schechter will take us through the impact of cosmetics and a contact lens use. Dr. Schechter. Thank you, Bridget, Brigitte, great work. Um, AV, I like to call it the devil in the form of technology. This is how things go, but I promise I'm in DC and I flew across the country to be here. So thanks for inviting me, my favorite eye event of the year. Uh, my name is Scott Schachter. I'm a private practice in Fismo Beach, California. I'm proud to be a TFOS uh, global ambassador. We're going to talk about cosmetics, contacts, and COVID, and what's been the effect on American eyes from quarantine. So to visit or revisit dry eye prevalence, it's a big number, uh, and it's growing. <clears throat> as many as 40 million Americans suffer from dry eye disease. Dry eye disease is typically composed of two different types. It, people tend to be either low on water, low on oil, or both. 86% of patients that suffer from dry eyes have some sort of form or form of meibomian gland dysfunction, which is low on oil. So there may be both, but a lot of them have problems with being low on oil. When we look at the glands, you can see in the upper, that's completely normal anatomy about 25 to 30 glands in the upper. And the job of that oil is to coat the tear film and prevent evaporation. If it doesn't, if the tear film evaporates too quickly and you see on the bottom, abnormal glands, and by the way, that's a 12 year old, <clears throat> just like Brigitte was showing us, you end up with dry eye disease, uh, inflammation, redness and irritation, and a lot of quality of life issues, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later but we really wanna to try to avoid MGD as much as possible. It creates all sorts of problems. What happens here is the glands secrete oil onto the lid margin. You can see on the left-hand side, those arrows are where the oil comes out. And every time you blink, the glands, the oil is pulled out. If you don't blink enough or you get blocked, then that oil stagnates, which can cause gland atrophy and death. And on the right-hand side, we see mascara migrating onto the lid margin, which ultimately can get into the glands or block the glands and blockage is something that can lead to gland atrophy and gland death. 
The problem being when you don't, when you have the oil not coming out, the tear film breaks up too quickly, that can increase the saltiness of the tears. And that increased saltiness or hyperosmolarity causes inflammation. That inflammation causes cell damage, which causes inflammation, which causes more damage. So it becomes looping and chronic. MGD is a significant burden on American society. What you're looking at here is MGD at the center of this and around the edge are all the items, all the entry points into the potential causes of MGD. So what we're gonna look at in particular are preservatives. How do preservatives lead their way into meibomian gland dysfunction and what preservatives should we be worried about? So cosmetics, not, uh, not uh, something I was super familiar with until the last couple of years. And uh, these brushes, I know I've seen a lot of brushes in my lifetime laying around, but I had no idea there were this many. And you get a sense of what women go through to look how they look. And on the right-hand side, you can see sort of a tutorial for contouring and highlighting. And again, what women do, the amount of cosmetics that get applied to their faces on a daily basis. So we're gonna take a look at about a 30 second, 30 second uh, video, which has been sped up significantly. So how does she look? How does she end up looking like she looks now? And so what we can see here is her going through a number of steps and I'm not that familiar with them, but we're seeing a concealer, powder, eyeliner, eyeshadow, lip enhancers, lip gloss. Uh, so she's going through an awful lot. And again, this is just about 30 seconds, but I know I've been sitting out watching sports while uh, my wife has been uh, applying all, all this makeup and it does seem to take a long time. So that's how she ends up and she's gone through all that. And so there's really no surprise. This is what a lot of bathroom vanities look like. Um, it's pretty shocking exactly how much type of makeup or mascara is there. Well, there's a lot. And this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, face primer, color corrector, under eye primer, brow pencil, mascara, lip oils, hydrating spray, finishing power. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, but there's an awful lot of makeup uh, that women apply every single day. So when we look at American Beauty Habits, a survey done about three years ago in May of 2017, looking at American consumers found that about 41% of Americans between the age of 30 to 59 years old wear makeup on a daily basis. When you look strictly as cosmetics, surprisingly, the men's market is not far behind the women's market. So men are actually applying uh, different, different items to their face every day as well. During quarantine, what's changed? So I like to call it mascara, uh, meaning that, you know, these days and, and today included, there's still a lot of meetings that go on, but everything now seems to be Zoom or Ring Central or go to uh, meeting or, or uh, Microsoft Teams. And it seems to me, I don't know what happened to a conference call or a simple phone call, but everybody seems to want to do their calls on video anymore. So women only have so much to work with when your face is, is closed or, or partially covered and in the workplace especially. So mascara is where we're finding this exaggerated eye makeup while wearing a mask. You only have so much to work with to make yourself look unique or expressive. You can't show your smile. So a lot of women are actually exaggerating their makeup and uh, again, calling that mascara. This is a picture of a number of uh, optometric colleagues and friends of mine who just donated uh, some pictures to show what they're doing. And a lot of them did mention uh, that they are using more mascara than usual. Some are not using mascara at all. And they've actually cut back on their makeup and they're telling me that their eyes are feeling a lot better. Just anecdotally, I'm hearing that. So when we look at the impact of cosmetics on the eye, and in the body, uh, the US decided that we're gonna come up with some banned ingredients saying these ingredients can be toxic to the eye and they're harmful, they're dangerous. So we're going to enact legislation to say these following compounds or ingredients are not going to be allowed. 
it's a single page. You can see there's about 11 or 12 um, um, ingredients that have been banned, which is great. And that's good for the safety of our American women and anyone who wears cosmetics. So if we go across the ocean to find out what's been going on in Europe, in 2009, Europe came up with a new list of banned ingredients. And I thought, okay, well, I found this online. Why don't I just print this out so I can take a closer look at it? And I'm not sure if you can see that, but I went, when I went to print this, it actually turned out to be 62 pages long, 62 pages. And what I found when I went to the end, it was actually 1,623 banned ingredients in cosmetics in Europe. Now, why would that be? Why would the US have a single page of banned ingredients and Europe has over 1,600 banned ingredients? Well, I can tell you exactly why. The last time that our legislation was updated to protect Americans from the ingredients of cosmetics was signed into legislation by FDR in 1938. And we just celebrated the 82nd anniversary of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So that's right, that man, that fine president right there is responsible for the ingredients in that eye doctor's mascara, which is kind of mind blowing actually. So why should we care? Why should we care what ingredients are in makeup? Well, take a look at this picture that's from a friend of mine and colleague, Lyndon Jones, an optometrist in uh, Toronto, uh, in Ontario. Uh, and what we see here, and this is a view that we get similar to what eye doctors look at every day under low magnification behind a slit lamp. This is a contact lens wearer. So the first thing we notice on the contact lens there are some black spots. Well, that's eyeliner. So she put her makeup on and she applied her eyeliner and it ended up directly on her contact lens. We also see mascara on top of the oil glands or meibomian glands and migration of the eyeliner, which is re resulting in redness short term, but potentially much more uh, worrisome in the long term. This is something that eye doctors are seeing in their practices every day. So here's just a, another couple pictures of uh, makeup in the eye. On the right hand side, you see all those little spots. That's actually some form of makeup floating in the tear film. It could be concealer, it could be eyeliner, it could be mascara, it's hard to say. But when that patient blinks, you'll see this massive debris of makeup floating around in the eye, interacting with these mucous membranes of the eye. On the upper left-hand side there, uh, that picture, very, very interesting recent case, a woman in Australia presented to her uh, ophthalmologist in Australia, and she said, my eyes are really bothering me. And the doctor took a look and found some scratches on the front of the eye on the cornea. He couldn't figure out why, so he looked underneath the eyelid and those black spots that you see are actually mascara that's become part of the conjunctiva. It's become encapsulated and it's elevated and it's scratching the cornea. Essentially, this woman, by the way, never removed her mascara. And, and that as a side note, it's very important to remove your mascara every single night. There are studies that show that that's important to do but her makeup essentially has become a part of her body. And what possibly is going on? What's leaching out? What are the short and long-term effects of this? But she was miserable and, and uh, the takeaway, uh, very important to remas remove mascara every night and really watch what ingredients are in your makeup. The top 10 ocular offenders. So these are really the worst of the worst in terms of what we still find in cosmetics in, in, in America. The number one being parabens and the whole list that you can see there, including phenoxyethanol, chlorphenicin, benzoconium chloride, alcohol. Uh, these are all a big problem, short term and long term. They cause a lot of irritation. Some of them actually uh, penetrate a lot further past the eye. We're taking a look here now at the most recent research. This actually just came out um, out of Harvard, uh, Dr. David Sullivan behind this study, uh, looking at the toxicity of cosmetic preservatives, in particular, parabens, phenoxyethanol, chlorophenicin, 
on human meibomian gland epithelial cells. So the cells that we looked at, the glands we looked at in the beginning, the oil glands, what effect do these preservatives ha have on the epithelial cells of these oil glands? The net result, the conclusions were that methylparaben, ethylparaben, phenoxyethanol, and chlorpheniacin are toxic to human meibomian glands. So these preservatives are actually causing meibomian gland death. Think back, 40 million Americans suffer from dry eye. 86% of them have meibomian gland dysfunction. This is part of the problem and continues to be part of the problem. And we now have seen this in research. Looking at the contact lens world, and this has been a little bit controversial. Uh, first prevalence, about 45 million people in the US wear contacts. And we see that number increasing just a little bit every year. Some of the complications, serious eye infections that can lead to blindness affect one out of every 500 contact lens users per year. We see a lot higher number of minor infections and inflammation with contact lenses, but the serious ones are about one out of every 500. The reason for this is patients not following proper contact lens care instructions that's linked to the serious infections. When we look at how many of our patients, when we are telling them how to wear their contacts, how to take care of their contacts, between 40 to 90% of contact lens wearers do not properly follow our instructions. They don't disinfect them correctly. They store them in saline instead of disinfecting solution. They wear them more longer than they should and they don't throw away of them, throw them away when they should. Keratitis, the most dangerous of all microbial keratitis, this painful infection and potentially site-threatening infection leads to 1 million doctor, doctor and hospital visits annually at a cost of $175 million to the US healthcare system. Is the virus in the tears? Well, that's controversial whether the virus can be transmitted via tears and its ocular implications have not yet been widely studied. Ocular manifestations such as conjunctivitis are more commonly reported. However, we tend to see these more in late stage COVID patients. They typically are not the initial presenting uh, sign. The exact pathophysiology of ocular transmission of the virus does remain incompletely understood. There are some studies going on, but we don't have a good grip on that yet. Is the virus in the tears? Yes, it is. Studies currently show it's not often as far as we know to this point. Anytime we're talking about COVID, I think it always has an asterisk. It's true today, may not be true tomorrow. The eyes may be an entry point for the virus, but appears less risk as a source of the virus. So the concern being, if you have the virus or the virus ends up on your face, on your hands, and you touch your eye, it can get into your eye and your body that way. Is contact lens wear safe? Well, two academies, the American Academy of Optom Optometry and Ophthalmology both issued statements somewhat similar. The Academy of Optometry said there's no evidence that contacts put you at a greater risk of COVID-19 infection. Do not wear contact lenses if you are sick, and that's pretty much true anytime. All these are pretty much common sense. Wear, wash hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water and dry with a clean paper towel prior to handling the lenses. Throw them away then you, when you should and disinfect them as you should and don't sleep in your contacts. And the number one recommendation right now to not, the reason behind not sleeping in your contacts, it may be more difficult to get into your eye doctor. The CDC asked eye doctors to stop doing routine care at the beginning of the pandemic. We're back to that now, but it may be some, in some cases more difficult to get into your doctor. When we look at the, what the Academy of Ophthalmology had to say, they recommended if you wear contacts, consider switching to glasses for a while. And that's related to what I just said. It may be more difficult to get into your doctor. There is no evidence that wearing contacts increases your risk of infection, coronavirus infection. But contact lens wearers touch their eyes more than average. And that's really the concern. Wash your hands a lot, follow good contact lens hygiene. We look at the big takeaways here that are important to know with contacts, it's okay to wear them, but hygiene is of, of paramount importance, it's critical. There are a lot of unknowns about COVID in the eye. Looking at cosmetics, recent, recent Harvard research confirms cosmetics preservatives cause or worsen dry disease. FDA cosmetic 
regulations not updated for 82 years, 82 years. And that creates a challenge for us as eye doctors. We need to make sure we're educating our, our patients as to potential harm. And certainly more research is needed in these areas. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Essen Akpek. Um, I practice ophthalmology, particularly cornea and external diseases at the Wilmer Eye Institute, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, I will be speaking to you over the upcoming 10 minutes or so um, about uh, how COVID-19 played a huge role in anterior segment diseases, cornea, ocular surface, and tear film. Uh, we were ordered to stay home in Maryland um, in the middle of uh, March or so. Some of us are back to normal, uh, somewhat normal um, on, on a lower capacity, but majority of the of office workers are still uh, staying home. Uh, the businesses have been shut down, the schools were shut down, and cl classes were online. Um, so all the online work um, took a toll on all of us across the uh, world. Every single individual was affected from that, uh, particularly the front of the eye or the ocular surface, including tear film, um, had a big impact. Um, I wanted to go over the tear film anatomy and ocular surface before we talk about dry eye and how COVID-19 um, had an uh, influence on that. As you all know, um, the tear film covers the ocular surface at any uh, given time. It has three unique layers. Each layer is excreted or secreted by a different tissue or cell group on the ocular surface. The innermost layer is the mucin. It comes from the goblet cells that cover the white of the eye, uh, the conjunctiva that cover the, covers the right, white of the eye. The aqueous layer, which is the thickest layer, the middle layer comes from lacrimal gland as well as accessory lacrimal glands. And the top layer, which is thinnest, but perhaps the most important is the mabum layer. Uh, and it comes from the mybomian glands, which are located in the tarsal plates, um, about 20 or so in each lid. Ocular surface or the tear film um, uh, that covers the ocular surface it is pretty unique. It's much different than any other body secretion such as urine or, or saliva. The reason is because there are two main challenges um, that the tear film has to overcome. The one is gravity. Uh, and mucin layer is what provides the sticking of the tear film onto the eye surface. The other one is the evaporation or drying up. Because the eyes are open to air, there's constant evaporation and that needs to be met with constant tear production. What happens during gazing or uh, sustained visual activities such as driving, doing computer work, reading, watching TV is that um, the tear secretion cannot always catch up with the tear evaporation. And that's a lot worse in patients with um, dry eye than normal controls. And what can happen is that uh, the osmolarity of the tear film, which is the ratio between the electrolytes and the water part uh, is disturbed. And that causes a hyperosmolarity, which is detrimental to the ocular surface, the epithelial cells of the cornea and conjunctiva. And that causes inflammation and the ultimate result is a, a, a structural changes and damage to the ocular surface. Another challenge that we have on the ocular surface is the constant regeneration of the cells. Just like the skin cells, the ocular surface cells, the epithelia of conjunctiva and cornea constantly shed into the tear film and there has to be a regeneration to um, regenerate the ocular surface. And this does demand a good hydration and nutrition and all those things have a toll on the ocular surface. 
I think we're all familiar with omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, unsaturated, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids are part of MABEM, which is, as we talked about, uh, the part of the top layer of the tear film. Omega-3 fatty acids need to be, they're called essential fatty acids because they need to be taken uh, exogenously with food. The body cannot uh, produce uh, these polyunsaturated fatty acids that are essential part of the mabum. They're also anti-inflammatory. Uh, vitamin A is very essential for goblet cell health, but also retinal health. Uh, you may have heard about night blindness that occurs with vitamin A deficiency. Uh, the most common um, reasons for vitamin A deficiency in the uh, developed world, world are alcoholism, and bariatric surgery for losing weight. And these are um, still not very well recognized in dry eye practice and, and they need to be. There are also other micronutrients such as vitamin B12, vitamin C, D, selenium, and other uh, micronutrients. Vitamin D is especially very important. A lot of studies demonstrate that particularly women with significant dry eye, are found to be deficient in vitamin D. And the body cannot make vitamin D unless we get adequate sun exposure, UV exposure. And obviously during COVID lockdown, we did not get to uh, be outside um, because of the um, restrictions. And another thing that happened during COVID pandemic is the unhealthy eating habits. Majority of us, such as myself included, um, ate very unhealthy food, comfort food. Um, and also there was an element of uh, anxiety and depression, not knowing what's gonna happen next. Uh, these things took a big toll on everyone. In fact, the global lockdowns led to universal psychosocial impact by mass fear, economic burden and financial losses. We, I myself have not experienced financial losses, but I know of people who got laid off or furloughed, and that definitely played a role in their um, depression level. And we all know that patients with dry eye feel depression, just like any other body pain, and antidepressives cause dry eye. So there is a close connection between those two. In fact, there are many publications demonstrating uh, the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on mental health, um, already published. Another effect that COVID-19 pandemic had is, is the telework. Even I myself experienced that because we started doing telemedicine, particularly for patients who were having flare up of their underlying disease uh, or patients who were having difficulty uh, with their vision or ocular comfort, such as dry eye patients or patients with other ocular inflammatory diseases. And I myself started experiencing the same thing as the patients were talking about, which is discomfort of the eyes and particularly blurred vision. We have a staff writer within um, uh, Department of Ophthalmology, Amy and Twistle. Uh, she and I put together this article um, in one of our um, Johns Hopkins uh, publications uh, about how patients with dry eyes started experiencing, even the stable ones prior to COVID-19, uh, started experiencing worsening of their dry eyes with all the increased workload, uh, you know, doing um, telework, basically. So if we remember the um, anatomy of the tear film, you know, the eyes are open to external uh, environment and there's constant evaporation of the tear film, which, um, has, which has two implications. One is discomfort symptoms because of the dryness and punctate epithelial erosions that um, Dr. Lee mentioned during her talk. The other one is the blurred vision. Um, unfortunately, even to this day, um, visual impact of dry eye or um, vision related quality of life impact of dry eye are under recognized and under appreciated. If you look at the published literature, there's 
actually scarcity of the publications research regarding how dry eye affects vision. In fact, many of my patients, when they come in and complain of their dry eye, their main uh, problem is, is the vision problem. Perhaps because I see patients with more severe dry eye, they have a lot of punctate erosions and they complain of not being able to see. When they say that, arguably, I think what they're talking about, when they say not being able to see, they mean not being able to read. They, they don't mean that they can't see to read or write a check, but they can't sit and read for prolonged periods of times. It took me a lot of time to understand exactly what was bothering their vision. Because when you measure the vision, it's 2020. They have no uh, color vision problem. They have no, um, for example, uh, vision field problem. But if you look at their contrast sensitivity, for example, it is much decreased than normal. Uh, contrast sensitivity is, for instance, one of the uh, indications for cataract surgery, but it's almost never um, associated with dry eye. Another thing um, that dry eye leads to, which has been shown through research, is decrease in reading rate or reading speed. Um, there's again scarcity of the articles published in the field, and some of them come from our research at Wilmer, demonstrating that even with short uh, passages, the reading speed in dry eye patients is a lot less. For example, three to five words per minute less than normal age matched controls. But when you, when you use longer texts, for example, the one that we used, which takes about 30 minutes to read, composed of 7,200 uh, words, the difference between dry eye patients and normals um, becomes even more significant, 10 or 12 words per minute. But if you think about an office worker doing reading computer work for about eight, nine hours a day on a regular basis, the impact is huge. Uh, on the flip side, these individuals with dry eye also get worsening of their dry eye after the reading because the eyes are open to air, environmental stimuli such as desiccation, low humidity, draft air, etc., play a huge role. Um, and then individuals who need to do gazing for their daily activities will have worsening of the punctate erosions of the cornea, and then their vision will get more blurred, and then it takes them longer period of time to read or, or to get through the same material or amount of work, which is a vicious cycle. Uh, so, the current study that we are doing um, is related to a um, survey that we sent out to dry eye patients as well as normal individuals, um, trying to understand uh, how COVID-19 lockdown and work, stay home and telework, work from home, played a role in their um, symptoms. Thus far, about 300 individuals responded to our online survey that was sent out um, about two weeks ago. And there were two things that uh, basically jumped out from the uh, survey results. So we we're not fully finished with the analysis, but the one was that uniformly Dry eye patients were talking about the worsening of their symptoms, not only the discomfort, but also blurred vision, which again, as we talked about, has a big impact um, on their um, uh, productivity. But the second thing that was even more sad was that because of the financial losses, they were actually rationing their medications. Majority of the patients could not afford their prescription eye drops and they had to switch their cells to over-the-counter medications. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that for now, but I do wanna say that we are doing further research, trying to understand what these patients are going through, what it means having dry eye, um, you know, in, in a you know, regular daily um, function. And hopefully I will be um, uh, in touch again through publications and presentations to increase awareness uh, among um, all of us uh, regarding the visual aspects and vision-related quality of life aspects of dry eye. Thank you so very much.
for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Essen and Dr. Scott. Those are awesome presentations. So just a quick review. Um, I discussed digital eye strain and the pediatric dry eyes and Dr. Scott Schechter covered contact lens use and cosmetic use and Dr. Essen discussed malnutrition and depression in the era of the COVID-19 pandemic. And now we would like to open the floor for questions. Please feel free to submit questions on YouTube or uh, if you have a way of messaging us, message us. And we definitely want to thank everyone here and everyone who has tuned in to watch us virtually. Okay, here's the first question. This is for Dr. Schachter. I'm trying to read this question. So Dr. Schachter, would you discuss um, the effect of the wearing mask and how does that, that affect our ocular surface of wearing mask for hours at a time? Well, I think a uh, good question. You know, we uh, we're certainly see uh, a lot of people don't wear masks correctly. They wear them um, away from their face or not. They don't have a good seal. They fog up their glasses. Uh, they wear it over their, <clears throat> their mouth, not their nose. Um, one thing I see a lot of is actually coming up the top of the mask when they don't have a good seal. That causes what's called desiccating stress. And that desiccating stress is a big problem. That can cause inflammation. Uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Daryl White, recently wrote something in regard to this. Daryl, I did not get a chance to read that yet, but he has some sort of a, ma a theory on mask-related dry eye. And uh, I think, you know, as eye doctors, when we are examining patients, it's important for us to make sure we get, have a good seal. Otherwise, we can't really examine the eyes since something's going to fog up. So some people will put uh, a, a Kleenex above or tape or something. To, if you don't have a good seal, the mask isn't really doing what it should be doing. But we are seeing, so I'm certainly seeing in my practice a lot more dry eye complaints. I couldn't say for certain it's related to mask wear, but we're seeing a lot more dry eye. How about you? We are too at my practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Schachter. And this next question is for Dr. Essen. Dr. Essen, will our eyes go back to normal after the quarantine? That is, did the quarantine speed up the occurrence of dry eye? Would that be permanent? That's actually a very good question in that um, some of the dry eye that got worse um, during the COVID-19 might go back to baseline and, and still become a, a sporadic or once in a while thing that has to do with the amount of work that's being done. But there's also such a thing as after repeated insult on the ocular surface, the inflammation becomes self-perpetuating. So if a patient started or if an individual started with a moderate or so dry eye, uh, the, the, the problem actually might become permanently worse unless it's treated appropriately and aggressively. I also have a question for Dr. Schachter. Is there such a thing as safe makeup? Patients oftentimes, oftentimes ask us which brand I should use if I have dry eye or sensitive eyes. Dr. Schachter, before you answer that, there's another question that came in uh, from user Papagayuko. Thank you so much for the question. The question is, how do you find out what eye cosmetics are safe? Dr. Schachter? Well, that's a great question. You really need to look at the ingredients. You may talk to your eye doctor or someone who's experienced with that. There's a group called Dry Eye Divas. You can find them online. They've done a lot of research and, and reading and writing about that. There are some uh, makeup lines out. I don't think there's a perfect one, although there are some being developed. Uh, take a look around. But I think um, if you've got a patient with chronic uh, dry eye or appear to have related ocular complications, ask them to bring in your makeup. You can help them with that. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's not easy to find it. But there are there are products coming out that might support that. Perhaps something held to European standards. 
Thank you, Dr. Schechter. And thank you all so much for tuning in to join us. And here's Jim. Thank you, Brigitte. We appreciate you tuning in today. This video will be accessible on YouTube moving forward. We will also post a story on our website and provide the slides as necessary. So again, we appreciate all of our speakers coming to Washington DC and presenting such excellent presentations today with such great accompanying audio visuals. We look forward to continuing to educate through AVERS educational programs and we'll be announcing some further briefings for the fall live streamed. So on behalf of AVER and TIFOS, we thank everybody for attending the briefing this afternoon. Thank you.